Hi, my name is Nancy St. John. I'm a visual effects producer, and I'm the second vice chair of the Visual Effects Society. Today, we are broadcasting live from the main theater on the Walt Disney Studios lot to venues across the world. Our visual effects sections in Vancouver and Montreal, New York and London, have watched the film with us and will be participating in this panel. We are also recording this panel so that our 3,000 visual effects members um, in 31 different countries can see it on our website. Before I introduce this incredible, maleficent visual effects team, I'd like to thank Disney for providing prints for our visual effects sections to view and for securing, th securing this theater in Burbank and the Dolby Theater in New York. I would also like to thank Capilano University in North Vancouver, Canada, Technicolor in Montreal, and the Moving Picture Company in London for providing viewing facilities and hosting the screening today. A quick note for all of our audiences everywhere, for all of you tech-savvy, Twitter-savvy folks, please tweet your questions for our panelists and be sure to include hashtag VES Maleficent. Now, it is my honor to introduce our esteemed panel, Senior Visual Effects Supervisor, Carrie Viegas, He is an Oscar, a BAFTA, and VS Award nominee. Adam Valdez is from uh, Motion Picture Company, Visual Effects Supervisor. Digital Domains Visual Effects Supervisor, Kelly Port who is also a Visual Effects Award nominee, and Darren Handler from DD, his, our Digital Effects Supervisor. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a seat. <laughs> so we have questions. Um, we can take questions from the group here. We'll also be receiving questions from Twitter. When do we know when we have questions from Twitter? <laughs> okay. Well, Carrie, how would you like to start by sort of explaining to everyone how you decided to divide out the work amongst, you know, DD and Moving Picture Company and your own internal group? Sure, my pleasure. Um, first, I'd like to just thank the VES and um, Disney for having the screening and for having us here today. That's a special honor. Um, I'd also like to thank on behalf of our visual effects producer, Barry Helmsley, who is not able to be here with us. He's in London. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Joe Roth, of course, for producing the film, and um, the support team here at Disney, um, uh, led by David Tartero, our senior visual effects uh, executive in charge of uh, visual effects here at Disney, was, was amazing, gave us a tremendous amount of support. So I'd like to thank um, all of Disney for that. Um, for Really, to start off, we, um, well, I think we had about 1,500 shots that ended up in the final film. And uh, we always knew that we we're going to be sharing a lot of the assets. Um, so we wanted to keep it very limited in terms of how broadly we distributed out the visual effects. So um, what we did was brought on Moving Picture Company, um, led by Adam here uh, in London, and also uh, Seth Morey, who unfortunately is able to be here with us as well, uh, on the Vancouver side of MPC. And then we brought in Kelly Port uh, from Digital Domain. Um, and uh, pretty much Digital Domain handled anything related to Maleficent, and that included her wings. Um, any digital doubles of her that we needed for the film, uh, as well as all the pixie, uh, our flower pixie animation and characters there. And then um, MPC pretty much handled the rest of it, honestly, you know, from Diaval to tons of environments. And Digital Domain, of course, contributed with tons of environment work as well. Um, and then we had a small internal team here in Los Angeles, and uh, we divided some of our um, floating, the Aurora floating sequences and Philip floating sequences internally, and then we'd kind of just or a stopgap for the rest of the visual effects. Uh, and then uh, we had some help at the very end um, with, uh, by the Senate in London, as well as um, uh, a method in Vancouver. And I think of, of the total of the 1,500 or so visual effects shots in the film, uh, I think in terms of shot counts, it, it ended up something like, I think uh, just about 700 shots were contributed to, to, um, to the film from MPC, and I think about 400 from Digital Domain. And I think uh, just shy of like 350 or so for our internal team, and then another dozen or so from the other two vendors. 
Uh, and then also, um, of course, this film was a, a stereo film, as you saw, uh, which was dimensionalized in post. Um, it was always planned that way, um, but we had a, a lot of uh, help on that aspect, of course, and that was divided up between um, a few companies as well. Uh, Legend, um, uh, Generate was our prime uh, company, and they did probably about 65% of the conversion work. And uh, I think um, Prime Focus did about another quarter, and then the rest was done by Legend. And then, of course, we had some native, uh, purely rendered um, shots that were handled between the two companies up here. So, um, so that's kind of the, the, the bulk of how we distributed the work. And again, because of it was, there were so many shared assets, you have Maleficent combined with uh, soldiers and various scenes, and th those were shared shots. So I think, I think the shared shots throughout the film rate are numbered to be about 650 of, of the bunch, so it was quite a few huge shared shots, and so it was, it was a pretty, you know, as you can tell, it was a huge collaborative effort. You can see all the, the scrolling names on the screen. I think an interesting statistic that uh, Barry gave me was, I think there was 2,190 people that contributed to the visual effects in some way, whether it was in production or post or previs. And actually, I should mention the third floor who contributed greatly to all the, the previs and postvis for the film. Wow. So what was it like working with Angeli Jolie, she was magnificent in this movie. Um, tell, us, tell us about your experience working with her and then bringing her wings to life and uh, her whole character. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let, I mean, obviously since Digital Lemaine did all that work, I can let uh, you know, Kelly, Kelly start out and Darren can jump in as well. Sure, uh, from the beginning, um, Carrie and, and Robert Stromberg uh, spe specifically in regards to the wings, uh, the wings needed to be sort of um, uh, an emotional supporting character uh, for Angelina. So whatever her particular performance was in a scene, they needed to support that with the animation and their behavior, but also had to be um, somewhat of an independent character themselves. So um, that was sort of the driving force in terms of the animation. Um, the complexity of uh, technical complexity underlying the, the build of the wings uh, was pretty complex. They uh, had hundreds of feathers on, that were individually modeled on each wing. Um, and just the rigging involved was pretty uh, intricate. Um, she did a lot of her own stunt work in terms of getting up on a rig 20 feet high over blue screens and doing all sorts of crazy moves. Um, a lot of those rigs were in a wishbone type uh, configuration, so she was rigged and with harnesses around her waist, and so a lot of that, depending on her costume, would have to be removed. Um, and given that we were doing a lot of digi-double work, we would sometimes, um, on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, decide what was the most appropriate way to remove that rig, because uh, it was bulky. Sometimes it was underneath her costume. And as you can see, some of the costumes are quite intricate and many layers of flowing fabric and different materials. Uh, so with those particular digi doubles in that costume, um, there was a lot of, um, and sometimes it would get wrapped around the rigs. So we would have to make a decision if it was visible in frame, sometimes to um, completely replace either just that section where she was um, connected to the rig or if it was you know, wrapped around. Um, sometimes it was easier to replace her whole body uh, and keep just the neck and chest area, perhaps, um, versus painting it out, which is more of a frame-by-frame, -frame, uh, time-consuming process. So if we were able to um, kind of match it in and, and actually replace the whole body, we did it. So, you know, that's, that's of course, a case-by-case -case scenario. And, and uh, working with her um, on set and, and in post, uh, Carrie can probably speak to that uh, more specifically, but um, you know, she had a great eye and, and had very, very specific uh, needs, and it was uh, very, very detailed in, in terms of how close a match we needed to get to her. Um, so that was very important from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> I guess the only thing was just, you know, we yes, when we started off building the wings, we really kind of were building them off based on like a real like a golden eagle type wing. And uh, you know, very quickly we realized that uh, the wings were gonna have to bend and con con contort into all sorts of different shapes. I mean, Rob definitely wanted to have control over the silhouette of the wings in all the different positions when they were folded, the way they looked in every shot. So you know, very quickly we realized that our rig, besides having to be physical and having all these feathers simulate and you know, ensure that they're all, none of them are penetrating against each other, 
they had to bend and contort in all sorts of different shapes. You know, we'd have shapes where we could have like a thousand feathers all sitting in the same position in space, and we'd have to make sure that it looked correct, even if it wasn't entirely correct, and you, know, you didn't see it kind of all spiking out or things going through each other the entire time. I think that was kind of one of the big and interesting challenges for us. We didn't quite realize how many different kinds of shapes and different profiles we'd have to sort of put these wings through. And speaking of the wings, you know, we knew that um, they, because they needed a character and life to their own uh, in most shots, um, and we wanted them really to be an extension of her, 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 her person, her, as you would gesture with your hands, we wanted those wings to actually, you know, speak with her as well. And so, um, you know, we did build um, a practical uh, version of those wings, both an open and closed pose that we would have on, have on set, and there's just a tremendous amount of work just went into that. I mean, it, it was a tremendous reference for us um, in terms of photo photographing it and taking it onto the various sets and just seeing how it responded to light. Um, but, uh, you know, it also gave the actors and specifically, you know, the director of photography uh, understanding of how much, how we could frame shots and the spacing because it was a 14-foot wingspan, I think, when they were fully extended. So they were, they were a massive uh, thing to, to deal with, for sure. Especially when you're shooting in a typical conversation scene, uh, your sort of normal uh, over-the-shoulder becomes trickier because you've got these giant wings and so you can't really be over the shoulder you need to get a little bit off to one side exactly. and uh, um, that was something that because we didn't always have these practical wings to sort of um, bring on and frame you know we were at a fast pace uh, shooting so um, it was something that we needed to constantly kind of remind as, as the shots were being framed up just to have an awareness of these imaginary wings that will ultimately be there um, sometimes that wasn't always the case, and so you'd have to kind of, in later when we were doing it, sort of skew them to one side or the other. And then you were also dealing with the different ages of, of Maleficent throughout the film. You know, starting as a young girl, then then transforming into the you know to the present day uh, Angelina character. So we also had to modify the wings based on the scale of of those characters. So that it was not just doing wings you know once, but it was you know doing them for two different, actually three different characters. Um, let's talk about the environments because they are just visually stunning. Um, there you were working with, with with a director who was who's already won an Oscar for uh, production design, Robert Stromberg, too. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about how you found the environments, um, how you developed the look of the environments? Um, some of that kind of yeah, absolutely, and I you know Adam can speak a lot to this because you know, MPC did a, a huge amount of environment work for us. Unfortunately, you know, again, we did start with uh, you know someone um, with like Robert Stromberg, who is you know just such a visionary in terms of you know the the artwork and things that he puts into any project that he works on. Um, he brought in Dylan Cole oh. uh, and Gary Freeman were, were our two production designers, and, and Dylan, like Robert, you know, has comes from a, a matte painting background and is able to uh, you know really not only just uh, give you a sketch, but to actually give you a, almost a photoreal rendition of, of an idea or a thought. And I think that's the really interesting thing that Robert was able to bring to the table uh, for us, is that uh, as a director, um, that you know, he has this, this uh, way to communicate his thoughts uh, in pictures. And he doesn't have to just you know try to explain something to you. You can actually you know take a, a, a piece of pencil and or a, you know a piece of paper and a pencil out and, and draw an idea. Or even better, you know he'll grab a stylus and a tablet and go into Photoshop and, and mock up a you know a photo real version of, of what he wants that to look like. So I know that was tremendously helpful 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 for all of us here. And I know Adam can speak more about a lot of the environment work that we did. Yeah, for I think for MPC the environments might have been yeah, as a strand through the movie the biggest challenge because. Um, well, first of all, you can tell looking at the movie that it's got this classic storybook look to it. And I remember walking into the production design rooms in the first weeks leading up to the shoot and just seeing a, walls of this amazing artwork. And you thought, oh my God, it's going to be crazy what we're going to make, you know? It's so, um, like some hybrid between a, you know, this illustrative painterly concepts. And there was all these style guides for kinds of trees and different things. and. Um, and then being a big green screen movie with, you know, maybe not everybody knows, but this is mostly an interior stage set movie. And so the big challenge was how to make an outdoor movie out of this, sh this photography. And there's this very classic Hollywood hard light a lot of the times on our characters, which, you know, kind of gives her this iconic 
thing that you're seeing in the posters all around the world right now, you know, this look of her. And so I think the challenge for me personally, and, and you know, Carrie and Rob and everybody, we were all working this through together and finding it, I'm sure it's the same for you guys, um, was how to, how to bring together all this stuff. You've got this kind of iconic photography and this graphic style, and you, you want it to look sort of storybook, but, but Rob really enjoys you know, lots of detail. So it was never going to be a graphic novel movie. Um, and I think it was just literally scene by scene, finding that sweet spot. Like, how are we going to make this one work? How are we going to do this one? And, and I remember one of the biggest things halfway through the production was, was this is very much a story of two worlds, the fairy world and the human world. And how do you know where you are? How's the geography clear? And um, so that was, cha to be honest, really challenging to figure this all out, you know? But I think in the end, it's funny, it's today is the first time I've seen it for a while. <laughs> And in the end, you know, I think the way it flows and the sort of magical quality of it and the beauty of it really works. And, you know, so I guess it's just sometimes, and I'm sure everybody in the visual effects community knows this, but this is definitely one of those cases for us where we helped find this movie along the way. And, you know, it was, it was everybody sort of being on the same team and sort of just working through it patiently and getting through it that brought it together. And te technically, I mean, it's a kitchen sink everything in the kitchen sink approach because yeah. we we did um some exterior shooting but not a lot we had a lot of green screen set work that was extended and then um, at mpc we we broke the movie down at the beginning and built a a fairly substantial 3d foliage library of plants and trees and components we could use and then we did a big foliage shoot like an element shoot later as well. So we had we had a kind of a catalog of things we could throw at it. It we actually ironically didn't go shoot a lot of additional plates. I mean, it was really a lot of like CG matte paintings, um, two and a half D projected environments. Like a lot of that, the environments where we're flying through things, and you know you have CG mountains with photography projected, and really just again throwing everything we could at all the different things as they came up, you know, and, and, and going with the evolution of the feel of it. Yeah, so having that tight loop with the Carrie and the director, and the great thing was, you know, Carrie and Dave T at, Dave Tarotero at Disney and Rob, I mean, these are all people who knew each other pretty well already, and so for those of us who were the new relationships, it was fun to kind of be invited into the family. Here, here are Pickering, that's we squabble over. We have a Twitter question. Yes, uh, from Vancouver, how did you shoot the floating trance shots of Aurora and Prince Philip? Uh, they're reminiscent of Milliers of Philia. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, actually, there, there was a, 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 a photograph that Robert brought and had this, uh, you know, it's just a nice pose of, of a woman with this long flowing hair with her arch back and just, it was just a, a still and he wanted to basically put that still into, into motion. Um, the thought was always to have an underwater sense, you know, it's undulating kind of really slow motion feel to it. And so, you know, I, I've done various things of this type in the past and, and it led me to, unfortunately, because we were, you know, constrained by our budget um, to not do everything you know, as a full CG approach. And I was also concerned with the level of detail that we needed to have on uh, the closeness of Aurora's face that it wouldn't hold up. So decided to shoot it practically. And uh, the way we did this is ended up um, building a body pan uh, essentially a, a, a body piece for for Elle Fanning to um, basically it was a mold around the lower part of her body from her, her hips uh, to through her middle lower back um, and that was attached to a six axis motion base and on top of the on, on beneath that motion base was a was a rotator so that you had a six axis motion base with a, a rotation as well component to it and then underneath that was a Ritter fan which would basically blow air up at her and so by the time you stacked all these things one on top of the other. It was literally 20 feet, 25 feet in the air. Um, and wow. Elle had her 14th birthday on the set of the show, so she is still a minor, so we have very limited time every time you bring her out onto set. And so we had this big scaffolding device um, that you'd have to climb up, and uh, they would, the customers would basically lay her in this device, strap her in, and then have to dress her in place. And the first, the first few times that we did that, it literally took almost an hour to dress her 
and then you remove the scaffolding here. Poor Al is suspended, you know, 25 feet in the air. And then we go and, and spin this motion base around like crazy, literally, because in order to get the slow motion effect, I uh, ended up shooting up to 600 frames per second. So everything, any motion that we needed to do had to be 25 times faster than that, because we were slowing the, the camera down that fast, or that, that much. Um, so basically, you're, if, if, if you're moving her you know, a certain amount of angle, you know, rotation, that rotation had to happen very quickly, and it would you know, basically spin her around <laughs> very quickly. And uh, we would do that, and of course, we get about 10 minutes to shoot her, and then we have to pull her down and start the whole process over. So we spent a good uh, two to three weeks uh, photographing that with Al. So she was a real trooper to, to hang in there with us. And it was so she was so high up in the air that we would have to put sunglasses on her because the lights were <laughs> so bright while she was while she was waiting. So it, it was it was tricky, but at the end of the day, I think uh, it all worked out. Torturing teenagers for film. <laughs> do we have another Twitter, or do we have a question from the audience here? Gray Marshall. Gray Marshall has a question. Okay. Oh, hey. Um, Carrie, this will come no surprise coming from me. Beautiful job, guys, by the way. Absolutely magnificent. Um, along with everything else, is there anything you can say about the color pipeline uh, concerning the distribution to many shops or anything? Is there anything particular uh, in this case that you ran into or utilized uh, as far as color correction and co color maintenance throughout the various um, uh, different houses and the uh, marrying between? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I'm, unlike Alice in Wonderland, which is you know very similar for me in my last uh, big film like this, um, you know, we were we needed uh, this really high resolution camera, so we went for the Dalsa uh, camera, which an evolution camera, which never had been used before, so it was a prototype camera. So there was no color pipeline for that, and we were intermixing that with Genesis material. So uh, for that, it was it was pretty complex. But for this, uh, Dean Semler was our uh, director of photography, and Dean is one of the pioneers of digital cinematography, having used the the. Panavision Genesis system. He's actually the first first one to use that on a feature film in Hollywood. So he was open for sure to digital uh, photography, and and so we knew with all the visual effects in this film that you know there was no question we were going to shoot it digitally. Um, but then it was, the only question was what camera we were going to use, and we opted for the um, for the Arri Alexa camera here. So being that uh, everything was shot with that camera, with the exception of the high speed stuff, which was a, a Phantom camera, um, the color pipeline was pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it's all, you know, which is great nowadays because everything's standardized, especially for a camera of that nature, um, you know, in terms of how you linearize that material and go from loxy back to, um, you know, a, a, a quote-unquote video uh, look to that. Um, so pretty much we, we use just standard algorithms that, that were, you know, based in Nuke um, or even, you know, ones that uh, Aerie gives you um, to, to linearize everything. And so everything was basically, did, I did a first pass grade. On, on everything, just using offsets, basically printer adjustments, um, not wanting to stretch things too far. Uh, in the end of the day, um, probably should have taken a little farther because we had a lot of atmosphere um, in our, a lot of our photography, which sometimes caused problems, um, you know, with with some of the contrast on, on various uh, scenes. But um, it was it was pretty straightforward. I know you know uh, MPC had a Aces pipeline um, partially to use some to you know um, blend the. The CG in with that, just to keep a, have a neutral base to, to work with. But um, everything was, you know, just delivered log C. Uh, we worked on it and put it right back out that way once it was linearized and back to log C and, and took it to the DI. So it was, it was pretty straightforward. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. But. No, I, I think we're. It's funny. I was talking to someone recently about. I remember the Cineon days, when <laughs> it sort of seemed to be worked out. And there was kind of one standard that everybody was sort of adhering to. And we're sort of in this chapter now, I think, of every movie. You just wait and see what the combination of DI and DP and visual effects and studio sometimes wants to do. Um, luckily, we have kind of a color guru here on our team. So, you know, we kind of knew we were going to be set up pretty well. Um, so we didn't really have to worry about it. I mean, I did say the biggest challenge is, you know, variations between viewing LUTs project to project kind of sometimes can swing things one way or another. And um, that can be tricky to accommodate if your pipeline in your company is rigid in any way. So, I mean, I think we always at MPC are trying to be accommodating. And the ACES thing is sort of an under the hood internal attempt to, to create a. Um, you know, to sort of go towards to try that industry standard that's maybe emerging and it might start being the thing that everybody can adhere to, um, at least as for parts of the pipeline. And 
that that did serve us well in terms of how to tie together different types of source material, including even stills material from asset photo booths and stuff, so that we're bringing together stuff into one color space, um, which unifies just inside the company. Um, like if you have a company that's working on multiple films at one time and you have different departments trying to kind of help each other out, that internal stuff can help with that sort of uh, workflow and approach. But for the film, yeah, you know, using like a standard setup that Carrie built for us for how to do the log C to lend conversions and back, um, using, you know, nuke nodes with pretty standard color offsets and things as a kind of way to swap grades and communicate back and forth. I thought it worked pretty well. Yeah, the one thing that was different here is that because every shot was, was a digital shot and every shot was visual effects in some way, um, it's not like we had to return things back to the original photography so the DI would have an easier time of integrating the visual effects shots back into the non-visual effects shots. So in this case, you know, I just we just kept everything you know, with the look that we built over the, over the course of the post-production because pretty much all those scenes were crafted in post and you know, obviously when Dean saw them again, you know, uh, a year and a half later, you know, he was, he was quite surprised at, you know, how, how different in some cases that, you know, from the original photography we had feared, but that was just, you know, the vision that, that Robert had for it. Question? Could you talk a little bit about the previs you used? Absolutely, yeah, like, you know, I said, you know, we used third floor. Uh, Mark Nelson was our, our uh, previs uh, supervisor. We, we basically uh, brought him to London with us and had a, a team there assembled um, internally um, at our production offices there. And throughout the pre-production, you know, we just went through and you know we storyboarded the film and went through and and tried to uh, post a previs as many scenes as as we could. Even though, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of things you know changed on set just because of the you know physical limitations that you have when you get out into real space. Um, but we tried to at least visualize as much as possible because it's on a film like this, it, you know, it's it's so tricky where where you're creating so much of it virtually uh, that that previs that you have that you can show you know the rest of the crew on your laptop whether it's the you know the first ad or the you know stunt people or or even the actors to show them you know where this will eventually go it's it's so helpful in that sense so third floor you know tr played a tremendous role there and then when we got back here for our director's cut uh, robert had about 12 weeks to put together his version of, of the film and um you know we did about well, 16 1700 shots i think uh, post, -fizz. post fizz yeah and then that was you know between third floor and our internal team as well let me gift you this hey guys great job great job really beautiful um i'm just wondering uh two questions one is can you speak a little bit about the beauty work um and sort of the facial changes and things like that that you did um, and also um, just sort of generalized rules and ideas that you put together. I mean, Kelly, you mentioned a little bit about the wings and flying by the seat of your pants, just trying to make sure always people were thinking about that. Um, but also you mentioned atmosphere, like things like that. What were some rules that you guys had and were working with because so much was fabricated? When you say the beauty work, do you mean in, in regards to like prosthetics? Yeah, like prosthetics and, and Angelina. I mean, um, there seemed to be quite a bit of work done there with the prosthetics. Well, she's pretty beautiful. It's not doesn't no. need a whole bunch of work. <laughs> yeah, no, but doesn't no, need it. But in, it looks in like reality, some. you know, there there was a lot of prosthetics that were applied to her. Obviously, the cheekbones. Um, you know, there's lots of wigs and things of that nature. So, uh, pointed ears. So there, there was always things that, that needed augmentation on the digital side of things, especially in emotional scenes, um, when the scene where she gets her wings cut off, of course, uh, when she's, she's wearing these prosthetics. And when, when you have this emotional scene like that, her, her cheeks would fill up with, with blood and get, get, get um, you know, much more red than the rest of her face. And obviously those prosthetics don't respond that way, and the rest of her face does. So th there's things like that where you have to augment and, and try to you know, blend those things and of course, you know, wig lines and, and there's always, always, you know, the rush of getting, you know, the shot. And so sometimes, you know, the, the artists out there, the makeup artists don't have all the time they, they need to, to finesse everything. So that's where we come in and, and, you know, try to clean things up a bit. So we did quite a bit of that. Um, and then, uh, so I'm sorry, what was your, you were asking else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> we all can, you know, talk about our atmosphere while I was here. Um, you know, that's one of the things. So because we had so many blue screens in, in the film, um, you know, Robert loves atmosphere, and I do too as well. But on a film where you have blue screen, it, you know, it's, you, you have to kind of play it down. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it got a little carried away for us. Uh, and we knew it at the time, but because of the rush of shooting, it was like, shoot, shoot, shoot. You know, we need, well, we need 10 minutes for the, the atmosphere to clear. 
and a lot of times we didn't have that that time. So there's some pretty foggy scenes that we had to try yeah, to work with. There was uh, one exterior where there was a blue screen, right? But you couldn't see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was there. Yeah. That's exactly. perfect. <laughs> so. Another Twitter question? Yeah, a couple of them. Uh, first question is, can you address the choice to post-convert to stereo instead of uh, shooting it native? And another one. Yeah, you know, you know, these these are all the the, the same scenarios everyone goes through when you when, you, when you're going to do a, a stereo film in the beginning, um, going through the scenarios of you know whether it's most cost effective to to actually do it in post or to shoot it uh, that way. Um, in the case of uh, this film, um, just because of the the, the tight time frames we had of shooting everything, um, just just didn't want to deal with the extra baggage of, of working with you know two cameras really. I mean, I would have loved to to shot it natively, um, but unfortunately the decision was all up to me, and, and it, it really comes down to, at the end of the day, is, is financials, and it, 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 it always, on paper, at least seems like it's it's more cost effective to, to post-convert. Uh, in this case, because we knew we were, we were doing that, um, the, like a scene, for instance, um, the scene in the crop fields where um, Maleficent meets Diavolf for the first time underneath the net. Um, you can see all of those those reads and all those things in that in that scene. You know, if we were to try to, because we were dealing with so many organic materials in this film, if you were trying to, you know, post convert that, it would have been an absolute nightmare and almost impossible to keep it clean. Although we did have to do quite a few scenes like that. But in this case, this is that um, element shoot that Adam was referring to. We pretty much went out and we brought in every conceivable type of tree and plant and grass and flower and, and we ended up just shooting layer after layer after layer of these on, on a blue screen stage and those things were then layered in the comps so then when we delivered those finished composites to our, our dimensionalization houses they already had these things broken out in separate layers so now it was dimensionalizing each component as opposed to trying to break them all apart. Same thing for the, the end battle with the dragon. Um, if, if you would see the, the, the scenes that were actually photographed, it's, it's amazing like how much is added there. And there's fires, there's all the embers, all the layers that are put in post were all built by Adam and his team uh, at MPC and uh, handed over again you know, to post convert and it made the job of doing that not only you know, easier but cleaner and, and it, you know, in the end of the day it just Maybe gave us a better look and even possible, yeah. Some things, yeah. I think the studios that are doing conversion now have a lot more sophistication with their tools and are advancing in, in ways to dimensionalize and still a lot of brute force involved but um, it also I think it can look really great but it does need uh, additional layers and, and a, um, a way and approach to shooting it that that takes that into account in order for it to look really good at the end interiors are great it's it's you know that those work out great and characters work out great it's, it's the organic things plants trees leaves and, and I think I mean, we might talk about this coming up, but when you know you're converting, like for us, it means every compositor is building the script in uh, anticipation of that delivery, so that that process is clean at the end. You don't, you know, we we found just over the years you have to some you know some compers their scripts are more messy and some are like spaghetti and some are like really tidy in the way they approach things and stuff, but if you know how you've got to collapse that and deliver it. I mean, I, this is probably one of the films, uh, one of the biggest sharing movies I ever worked on. And, it, and it, it, we were talking before this about how we had DDLA, DD Vancouver, NBC London, and NBC Vancouver. And we think there are probably some sequences or shots where all four companies worked on them together. Um, I remember the opening sequence we had to, we, we got a previs that we did a layout for, hand it to you guys to do animation and final cameras, come back to us, generate an environment, a lighting reference, go back to you guys, give us a Maleficent element, come back to us, do the final comp, go out to the stereo vendor. And this, there were probably on some like 10 steps sometimes to make sure everybody was happy and it was progressing. So it just feels more than ever that, you know, we're all in it together from, how you're shooting all the way to that stereo step and everybody's under such time pressures that um and you know some of sometimes we struggled with some things to share it or or we would send you a comp script that was huge in the data size or something you know and like all these little practicalities and logistics come into play like you're literally just into 
how fast can we get you the data or how fast is the data coming back in those final weeks and so I think that's a new challenge for our whole business is our whole, the whole industry is how you structure up to share because in the same way that the sort of 2D cheat is a thing of the past now <laughs> you know you kind of really have to work in real space and you because the stereo people have to work in real space and your effects TDs have to work in real space and nuke can work in real space so is the sort of um, hack it and deliver it approach you really have to you know, there's, there's no not that any of us ever hacked it in our <laughs> careers but you know there's there's not a lot of corners to be cut anymore so you really have to put a lot of energy on structuring things and, and it's still an ongoing challenge I think so question, uh, fantastic work. Love the fairies. Is there anything cool you can share about them? I think Darren. Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, in the beginning of the movie, uh, Carrie and Rob kind of approached us and we originally started talking about the three flower pixies um, who were you know, Disney characters, but they were going to be played by real actors. Um, and so it was just really important and you know, Carrie stressed uh, over and over and over again uh, how important it was that we make sure that we bring all the subtlety of the actors' performances. You know, we basically bring out all the nuances of these three amazing actors to those characters. Um, and so, to that end, you know, our entire approach for those three flower pixies were it was kind of built around um, based around building the real actors. And that was the first step in the process. You know, we scanned the actors through you know, the highest resolution scanning we could do, and we actually built three versions, three CG versions of the actors that were indistinguishable from the live-action actors. And then we could go back to Carrie and Rob and, and show them, like, hey, look, we have matched those actors, you know, and all of their different facial expressions and everything. We, we built them, even though we were never going to see those actors in the movie. And then from there, we really set about almost like digital prosthetics, you know, transforming those CG versions of the actors into the characters. And, you know, that way, really making sure that we could have maintained, you know, the likeness and the look of the actors in those characters. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Or so for the kids, basically what they did was they built the actors in the computer and made them look identical, put them up side by side, made them look identical. And then they turned around and pixelated them, <laughs> pixied them. Pixified <laughs> them. Pixified them. <laughs> Which is a, it's a, you know, I have to say it, it was a daunting sort of task uh, to do because this is essentially uh, doing one of the hardest things to do but it's never actually seen on screen but I think it actually did end up saving us uh, some significant amount of headaches because one it just instilled a level of confidence um, with Carrie and the directors in the studio that okay well, if we can't tell between these two at least we're hit we're doing something right you know we're we're hitting the shaders correctly and the lighting and the hair whatever uh, paying uh, extreme attention specifically to the areas of the face that uh, tell lots of uh, a character and emotion, the eyes, the mouth especially, paying a lot of attention to uh, fine detail, uh, displacement and wrinkles, things like that. And then, you know, the pixies are stylized to a degree for sure. They're, they're one, about a third the size of the human size and uh, heads are slightly bigger, their eyes are slightly bigger, their nose is a little bit smaller and those are generally to speak to your question Richard, sort of a stylistic rules that we were following in designing the Pixies initially and finding that balance between the essence of what those characters were in their live action forms was critical because they are in fact seen uh, in both forms, which is sort of a, a rare situation. We see them both in live action and pixie form, so you had to have that and find that essence of, of uh, Imelda Staunton and Juno Temple and Leslie Manville. They had to, what is it about them that, and we went quite a few rounds and just finding that balance, um, and that was critical. And then the, from an animator's perspective, they worked on, um, especially at the beginning, um, with those actors as base models and, and matching the dialogue and then sometimes there'd be a line change and that we'd have to change but um, that was very much uh, focused on the actor head uh, and then that was transposed or, or translated into the pixie form and, and we had to get moving you know on, on a lot of this stuff early on and I think even before the, the pixies were finally 
um, a design had had been finalized. So uh, this this is where that decision kind of came into play in, in going with the heads is that we were able to continue with animation and move forward uh, even with the pixies not yet finalized uh, in their designs. And so once that got finalized, we could actually just basically hit a button and then that all that animation would uh, transfer right back onto the new pixie design. Yeah, it was interesting here. Um, that, you know that with with these characters, when Robert was first describing them, he wanted them to you know behave kind of like hummingbirds and be able to dart from one place to another very quickly, and that we know they would be flying. So, the the the, the bounce. Do you how much of this do you do performance capture, and how much do you keyframe animate? So that was a, a fine line for us, and not really knowing 100% uh, which way to go. So we we definitely put all the the pixie performers, all the actors, in real harnesses. We had them suspended in in air in a motion capture volume, and we were putting them through the paces of all the, the, the moves, whether or not they could fully realize those motions or not. Um, we, at least you get this, you know, you get the real facial expressions and the real gravity effects that are happening on, on, on their faces as, as you're going through those motions. And then we would then take them off to the side after they did the initial performance, and then we would re uh, have them perform individually and repeat their lines of dialogue in a chair. Uh, and, and capture that with some high-resolution cameras as well, using uh, um, some technology that uh, Disney uh, has. A, Disney has a company in Zurich, uh, and they're basically um, a bunch of really smart guys, <laughs> PhDs, basically sitting in a room trying to decide, uh, trying to come up with just cool technology and how to use that for uh, Disney theme parks and Disney Imagineering and Disney films as well. And um, we uh, was talking to uh, Ben Morris over at Framestore early on in the production, and he's like, "Yeah, have you checked out these guys?" In Zurich, you know they're amazing. I'm like, no, I've never heard of them. And next thing you know, um, you know they're they're working on their first feature film with us, and, and they you know really aided in in that process as well. So that was great. I should mention David Andrews, our animation supervisor on digital main side. You know, did a a, a tremendous job. And then also uh, we had um, Warren and, and Catherine on the MPC side of things. You know, they just did an amazing job with the uh, with the animation. Diavol's animation for me was one of the, one of those real subtle things that how you put performance into a cool. into a real animal. You know, like that. So you cross the uncanny valley then? <laughs> we, won't, we won't go there. I don't we won't go there. Okay. Next question. Question from Montreal. Uh, can you break down the sequence where Maleficent breaks through the window at the end? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, obviously that was that was done a shared shot again uh, between uh, digital demand and PC. It was tr it was pretty tricky, obviously, having that type of interaction. With the characters, I don't know if Darren, if you or you want to talk about some of the technical challenges or Kelly. I think uh, that's funny. That's what you were <laughs> saying is one of those shots where I think uh, all four locations were involved. Uh, oh, right, because we, uh, we provided yeah. an interior view or something. From yeah, so that definitely was one of the well, was an extremely tricky shot, especially as far as sharing was concerned. I think originally there was a plate of uh, Angelina that was shot for it. Um, and then I think due to kind of the timings and sort of speed changes needed and everything like that, we'll end up using, I think, just some brief portions of her of her original plates and a lot of her body and everything like that landed up being all CG. Um, and I think that's a shot where we kind of, I can't even remember who did the original breakdown. I think we did some of the original animation and previs on that and then kind of handed that back to you guys, Adam. Yeah, and then oh, Seth, Seth, Seth Mori in Vancouver, our, our esteemed colleague who's not here today, he was responsible for all those castle exteriors. And, um, I'm, you know, bas I mean, basically NPC Vancouver by and large handled the human world, the, the battle scene, the armies, the castle scenes, and did a bunch of um, wonderful magic work on Diaval the Raven and the curse scene, that sort of wonderful scene. But yeah, in, in, in that climactic ending portion, all those castle flying exteriors, and so I think yeah. they worked out some camera, modified some stuff, popped it back to you guys, and then final animation came, and then we we were ch exchanging alembic caches for geometry and then using that to shatter the glass. Totally. And the difficult thing, I think, with all of this is, like, especially when you've got like, four different companies contributing the same shot, is with four different renders, is really sort of matching the lighting. And yeah. the, everything comes together and looks like it's all the same shot. Mm. Um, and I think for a shot like that, I think um, Seth and NPC Vancouver really set kind of the tone and lighting. And then we kind of used a lot of what they'd given right. us in um, some very rough HDRs to kind of then match in Maleficent and render Maleficent with her body and everything. Yeah. 
one of the interesting aspects of any of the animation that we did as far as Maleficent is concerned is that uh, Angelina actually had final approval and approval on all of her, her animation and all of her uh, digital doubles. So uh, she would, you know, she was part of the process, which, which was great, but I had never had to, uh, you know, present uh, animation to, to an actor before and have them approve their work. So that added another layer of, of complexity to something uh, that was already pretty complex to, to begin with. And I think, unfortunately, actors also are the best, uh, have the best understanding of their own bodies and their own look or uh, believe they do. So uh, it throws a whole new aspect into it. I was just uh, well, real curious, uh, how many practical shots or elements that you had in the, the movie versus CG? Wow, that, that's a really, you know, that's a tough question to answer. I don't, I don't think we can actually, you know, uh, quantify that in any easy way. Um, you know, pretty much everything was manipulated in some way. Um, you know, again, we, a ton of uh, fully CG assets, um, but also a, a ton of photographic assets that were added in. So that, that's a real difficult question to answer, but it was, it was a, you know, huge combination between the two. I mean, I guess that you could say we, we shot outside for the, the battle scene. We shot, there was an exterior cottage set where, around the Pixies cottage where Aurora grows up. Yeah, I mean, the, the, other exteriors. the rest the, of them were within sound stages. Really, yeah, we, so. we did, at the back of Pinewood uh, Studios, we built this pretty much this oh, the paddock huge paddock the, yeah. at the back of the, called the paddock tank there. Um, this huge exterior set, set that we use for a number of different scenarios and scenes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was important for Dean to control the light there. So we had these four towers built on either corner of this, this location with a huge silk, probably the largest silk that I've ever seen, and mm -hmm. certainly the largest silk Dean's ever worked with. And, He's pretty much done it all. So, um, you know, it was, it was like a, a huge sale on a windy day. It was crazy. But um, so that was our a tried, you know, a peer, a, a attempt to control an exterior situ um, a set piece. Um, but, you know, in this case, Robert really wanted to um, do a little differently than he did on Oz the Great and Powerful and, and what we did on Alice, um, where, you know, there's really very little set pieces, if, if any. Um, you're shooting in a green void for most of the time. And that was, you know, due to the Red Queen's you know, changing her head size and the scaling of Alice, but on this film, he wanted to be much more grounded in, in real, real elements. So, you know, that's where the photographic uh, plates that we shot, or the components that we shot in terms of blue screen trees and things that we were added in to those scenes later, uh, came into play. Right, and and I, I guess it's when you're in the all the exteriors, um, you, you have the typical sound stage, which might be about the size of this theater here, and you know, you're working within that volume. And I think more than most films where you might just mat, put a matte painting in the back, we really mid-ground sort of weave in some CG, some projected stuff, some matte painting layers, some foliage element layers. Um, it's probably know. safe to say that there's nothing that was just fully practical. Yeah, I think uh, something like, what do you say, Carrie? Ninety-seven percent of the movie is <laughs> oh, yeah, more, they, a little bit more. Pretty much right. Right. <laughs> had something done to it. Uh, we we have one other question, which was, um, who designed the characters that um, the dragon, the the bird, the who was responsible for? Uh, well, we had a combination of, of designers of characters. Um, you know, we brought in uh, Michael Kuche, who was a, a designer from Berlin that we used on Alice in Wonderland. He, he, I think he did the um, the little Wallerbog character. Frog guy. Um, yeah, and, and Robert, of course, you know, he designed the Pixies. He designed a lot of the characters on his own. Uh, Dylan Cole had a hand in a lot of that, and then uh, David White uh, and his team, who's one of the prosthetic designers of the show. Um, he had a tremendous base of artists that, that um, you know did a lot of design work as well. And then I'm sure. MPC on their end, you know, filled in all the gaps and, and did everything else. You did a lot of ZBrush. Uh, you know, I think most of the designs came to us with a pretty solid idea, right? And then some concepts artists these days will use ZBrush or something similar themselves to create an initial base sculpt and then maybe illustrate on top. So often we'd get those. And then, you know, go through that step step of trying to interpret a picture and make it three-dimensional is pretty tricky sometimes and then get sort of a base sculpt rotate it get everybody's approval for that step and then you go into the real final model and the final grooming of the hair and all the little details spin it again and then put it in a shot and see if it works and sometimes do additional adjustments I mean I've, I've been asked about the dragon a few times it's interesting because um, people really like it which is cool and 
I remember a conversation with Robert at the beginning when we were going, how can we do something new? There's like five billion dragons out there and um, what could you do? But I mean, the guiding principle, because he was Diaval the Raven become a dragon, it's the, the Diaval um, signatures, of the pointy beak and the black feathers and things that we used. So, um, you know, so you have him as a horse, which was largely, was almost 100% practical, wasn't it? Almost yeah, all practical. And then the wolf and the raven and the man and the dragon, one character. And so um, the raven actually, that was an interesting one. We, we just cast a real raven that was selected by Robert and we just photographed it a lot and uh, built an exact model of him. So we didn't design him as much as find movie star Raven <laughs> right. out there. Anyone else have any final questions? Thank you. Gorgeous film. Uh, I really enjoyed watching it. You mentioned that there were 2,100 artists who'd worked on this film. Uh, what was the schedule like? Wow. Um, <laughs> well, we started, uh, actually I started on in, in January of 2012. Um, in pre-production, and actually we didn't even know if we were going to make the film for sure at that point in time. Uh, it still didn't have a green light. Um, the schedule changed because our initial um, release date was March of this year, and then uh, it changed, I think, twice over the course of the production. Um, and then, you know, just things evolved, the stories changed, you know, we decided to, some things didn't, didn't you know, weren't as understandable as, as we thought, so we needed to go back in and, and modify those scenes, and so we went to reshoots. And So I, I think, uh, well, I'm not even sure about it, where, where the official schedule well, ended. Probably, but I mean, it's safe to say probably two years. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, I mean. But that's a large part of that, uh, probably for both of us, uh, both NBC and DD, was spent doing a lot of R&D up front. So the actual shot production part of that is overlapping. Yeah, much less than that. I mean, you know, and we ended up uh, finishing, uh, came back from London, I think, in November of 2012. So that's pretty much where we started the the director's cut of the film and then went into full um, post-vis mode just trying to you know fill in the gaps because you know it's, it's hard to tell a story like this one without all the visual effects components in place so um, that lasted through to like January I'd say and um, and from from January on I think it was our first turnover and uh, we went on from there. And we did element shoots in June July mm -hmm. I think July time and yeah. then a little bit of pickups in October last year and then we all delivered in March end of March yeah, this year. So it, was, it, was, it was well over a year in post for us. So. so we delivered final visual effects end of March, and it came out April, May 30th, right? So two months between final visual effects shots and in the, in the theaters. So, I mean, you know, pretty tight there at the end to make sure it was all... Yeah, especially with the post-conversion. Obviously, that, you know, that adds a, a lot of extra time, and, and you know, unfortunately for them, they didn't get all the time that they needed um, because we were, we were delivering shots. You know, we are barely getting sh you know, shots finished, so... <laughs> And then a lot of the a lot of the shots at the very end were shared shots as well. So yeah. we're all down to the wire on all of them, and they still have to be passed from one vendor to another vendor, <laughs> and then passed off to be post-dimensionalized at the end. Yeah, yeah. And I should mention Lane Friedman, who was our stereographer for for all that work. He did a great job in handling all the the craziness of us delivering late to him. <laughs> so the movie was 97 minutes finished. What was the timing for the director's cut? Um, I, I forget the exact timing, but it was well over. It was. Probably two hours and 20 minutes, I think, initially. And, and you know, we always knew it was always way, way too long. It was never going to be that long. But it's just one of those things where Robert wanted to be able to at least present all the ideas to the studio and then, you know, get everyone's feedback and go from there. So, but in the end of the day, it's a, you know, a, a brisker 97 minutes. So that's good. <laughs> tight. We like to say tight. Anyone else have any final questions? No? Well, I'd like to thank the gentleman for coming today. Fabulous. Thank you guys. Great work, and thank you all for coming as well. And thank you to all the people in Vancouver, uh, Montreal, New York, and London. All right, good night.